Hope all the men got naps. Nobody had to do yard work. Hey, man. All right. <laughs> you just never know. A couple of things. Remember the Boatmans? They, uh, Brother Boatman texted me a little while ago. They lost power and, and no end in sight, I guess. They're working on finding out what their problem was. But uh, anyway, of course, they got it set up on the generators and have to be there to kind of nurse that along. But be praying for uh, them. Don't forget puppet stage. We can have a couple of guys after service to be able to bring down the puppet stuff out of the closet uh, at the close of service. That'd be great. And uh, we can start on decorations this week. If you're able to come out and help with the decor, then come on. Yeah, we'll have a great time with that. Uh, outreach on Thursday at 6 o'clock. And uh, don't forget Miss Melba in your prayers. She uh, goes to the doctor to get her scan done tomorrow at 8.15. So if you'd remember uh, her that the Lord uh, will show the doctors exactly what's going on and that she'll have some good results. I'd be praying about that. I'm sure would appreciate that as well. And then Brother Ty goes back to see his uh, neurosurgeon at 1 o'clock tomorrow also, so be praying for him that he has good reports and checkup and all that kind of good thing as well. All right. Amen. Let's all stand together. <clears throat> we'll start out in a word of prayer. Brother Lee, Reed will lead us in, in song. Uh, Brother Josh Traham, would you open us in prayer, please? I guess Bring this prayer request before you tonight, Lord, for what was well, power, Lord, for the smell that we've got through skin, Lord, for any of those else who, who have elements, Lord, we pray that you would touch their body and you help them out, Lord. We pray, Lord, as we open your word again tonight to, to look into it, Lord, to learn of you. We pray that you open our hearts and our minds to what it is that you have for us, Lord. Help us to take it to heart, help us to learn of you. We ask all in your holy, precious son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you would, take your red hymn books with me this evening and turn over to page number 125. Page 125. Page number 41. Page number 41. Spirit shall 
shall sorrow no more. Not a sigh for the blessing of grass in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore to our bountiful Father above. We will offer our tribute of praise for the glorious gift of His love and the blessings that hallow our days. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Brother Jimmy, could you please ask the blessing over the offering this evening? Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. We thank you, Lord, for your unending, unfailing love for us. Thank you, Lord, when there was no way that you became the way for us and that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Pray, Lord, you all allow us to have an attentive heart for the preaching of your word here today, that we may have an increase in our faith and our fellowship in you. Your word tells us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Help us, Lord, to be obedient. We do ask, Lord, if there's one among us that does not know your believing, that today would be that day that they come to know you, allow you to change their heart and their life. Pray, Lord, that we will bring honor and glory to your name here today with all that we do and say. We ask, Lord, to take this offering, bless it, multiply it, use it for your kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. May be seated. may remain seated and turn over to page number 315. Page 315. Take my life and
this evening and look right across the page to number 317. Page 317. singing this evening. And if you would, let's take your Bibles and go to the book of the Revelation, chapter number 9. Book of the Revelation, chapter number 9. And whenever you find your place there, Revelation chapter number 9, I invite you to stand with me if you're able as we honor the reading of God's Word this evening. <clears throat> and we'll read down a little way. Revelation chapter number 9 and beginning in verse is that dead? No. Hang on. Is it there? No. I am. Yes. Yeah, I've got lights on. But nobody's home. Amen. Y'all yeah. knew it anyway. There you look. There's something. Okay. Oh, there we go. Yeah, don't move. All right, here we go. Revelation chapter number 9, verse number 1 says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him that was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, and the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and upon them was given power, <clears throat> as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. We'll stop right there. Our message this evening of is the woes begin. The woes begin. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for allowing us this opportunity to be in your house tonight. And Lord, we need to be able to hear from you. We pray, God, that you would give us understanding hearts of all the things that we see. Uh, Lord, so many of these things we have to piece together. We, uh, it's not something that we've seen before. But Lord, I pray that you would use this time to tender our hearts to be able to see the doom of those that do not know Christ. Lord, help us, Father, to uh, be ignited for the cause of Christ and the opportunity to be able to reach people at this time that you've given us, Lord, and, and give us just understanding in this time. We thank you for it all and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. <clears throat> so remember, we dealt with the seal judgments, and those first four dealt with the, uh, the horsemen, and uh, there was that white horse that represented a false peace. Uh, there was the red horse that was that uh, war, the black horse of famine, the pale horse of disease and death, and, uh, and hell that followed. And then uh, that fifth seal took us back to heaven. We saw some things that were going on there with the tribulation martyrs. And then that sixth seal uh, showed us the second coming of the Lord that included that great earthquake, the sun uh, being as black as sackcloth of hair, the moon as blood, the stars of heaven will fall to the earth, the heaven will be rolled up like a scroll. And um, 
But then we're taken uh, in chapter 7 back to that three and a half year mark where the 144,000 Jewish evangelists are uh, being sealed. Remember those are 12,000 of the 12 tribes of Israel, not your modern day Jehovah's Witness at your door. Uh, they were men. Uh, they were of those 12 tribes. They were virgins. That was their, uh, their qualifications. And then in chapter number 8, we got into the trumpet judgments and we started looking at those things last week. So the first trumpet uh, was that of an environmental disaster. Remember the third part of the trees were burnt up, all the grass was burnt up. Uh, then there was the second trumpet and it was a judgment that brought the uh, death of a third of the creatures of the sea. Uh, so major calamity. And remember, that wasn't just a matter of seeing, well, you know, the, the, the sea was messed up. It was the full fishing market. It was all of those, uh, the livelihood that's tied to that. And amazingly, we saw, we saw a lot of that whenever we were looking at Isaiah on Wednesday uh, as well. Then there was the third trumpet, and that was the one that affected the fresh water. So a third part of the fresh waters became bitter. Uh, that's your drinking water supply. That's all the animal, wildlife, all the things that could no longer drink. There's going to be massive amounts of death and carnage after that. And then there was the fourth trumpet. Uh, that brought a loss of the third of the light from the day as well as from the night. Where we left off we were told that there were still three woes to come. Uh, those uh, woes are the last three of the trumpet judgments, but they're different in what was happening before. There's still trumpet judgments that are taking place, and yet the effects of them are going to be different. Uh, the first four judgments of those trumpet judgments, they fell in the natural realm of the earth. So we start seeing how it affects the, uh, the trees and the grass and the salt water and the fresh water and of course all the wildlife and things of that nature. These last three woes are judgments that fall on the inhabitants of the earth, specifically those who did not have uh, the seal of God. And so that's what we're going to see. We're just going to look at this one woe uh, this evening and get a, a bit of a picture of what it is that's going on. Uh, first off, if you're taking notes, just a couple of notes for you to, uh, if you're jotting things down. Only two notes, two points, amen. Uh, the first thing that we're going to see is those that are, are the fallen rather, uh, the fallen. In verse number one, it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him that was given, uh, to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So who is this that is falling from heaven. Uh, some people uh, say that this is Jesus. Uh, now they're wrong. Amen. It's not that. So don't write that in your Bible. I said, Jesus, it's not Jesus. But I want you to know that that's what some of the things say because we need to be able to differentiate between that. In the same way, some people say that white horse that came of the four horsemen was also Jesus, and we were able to see uh, discrepancies that were there. That's the Antichrist. Amen. And so uh, remember, there are differences that are there, and there's still key differences uh, whenever you start looking at this this one that has fallen. And it is uh, Satan, and we're going to see a little bit more of that. We'll see a lot of detail about that whenever we get to chapter number 12. We'll see it then and get some further information. But for right now, uh, that's who we're looking at. Now, the, before we move on, though, why would somebody think it's Jesus? I mean, surely there's got to be something in there where somebody would kind of misconstrue something and say, well, it must be Jesus. And there's a couple of things that would kind of lead to it, uh, even though it's still wrong. All right, but let's see the, the argument here. Uh, in Revelation 20, if you go forward, Revelation 20, notice uh, verse number 1. <clears throat> Revelation 20, verse number 1, it says, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Well, that's a pretty good uh, key. Amen. And he says, well, here it is. There's somebody with a key and they're opening up the bottomless pit. Well, you look in Revelation 20 and says, uh, you know, here's somebody with a key opening up the bottomless pit. Verse number two of chapter 20 says, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Well, that was Jesus. Amen. So he says, all right, somebody's got a key. Well, here's somebody in chapter nine's got a key. Must be Jesus. That's the uh, thought behind it. Uh, it can be the same key, but there's two different purposes going on. There's two different times that are happening. Amen. You ever loan somebody your keys? Amen. You ever say, hey, uh, open the door. Here you go. You pitch the keys to your kids. Open the door. Sure. Most everybody has. Uh, most everybody says, hey, grab my keys. Uh, you, you'll get them there. You know, right? So, so it's possible that you can have two different people with the key. Amen? 
Two different purposes, two different times. Other people say, well, Jesus has the key of death and hell. Uh, we see that back in Revelation 1. Look at that, Revelation chapter number 1. <clears throat> We've already been there, won't rehash it all. But verse number 18, <clears throat> Jesus says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and had the keys of hell and death. So uh, the difference is the key of hell and death doesn't have to be the same key of the bottomless pit. Those are two different things. Say, wait a minute, I thought uh, that death and hell and the bottomless, I thought it was all the same thing. Uh, no, it's not. And remember, he's talking about two different things. How many of you have one key on your key? Wouldn't that be nice, by the way? You know, I was just thinking about it. that. would just be a great idea. You know, it's like everything that I would ever need has this one key, as long as you don't lose it or somebody steal it. But anyway, uh, but, but a lot of times you got different keys on your keychain. Now, we look at Revelation 9, verse number 1, and obviously, I'm not going to say obviously, uh, it, but I'm going to tell you, it cannot be Jesus. This cannot be Him. Uh, first of all, and, and the, the thing that's probably biggest, look at it in chapter 9, verse number 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star, uh, that star, remember, talks about different messengers, talking about different angels that were there. We see that uh, taking place in Scripture already. And so it's, I saw a star, what's the next word? Right. Fall. He said, I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So a couple of things here. Uh, first off, this angel falls from heaven. Jesus did not fall from heaven. Nowhere does it say Jesus ever fell from heaven. Jesus came down from heaven. There's a difference in falling versus coming down. Now let's look at a couple of places. Go over to John chapter number 3. Now keep your Bible handy. If you're not a Bible enthusiast, you're going to have a miserable time tonight. <clears throat> John chapter 3, and look at what he says in verse number 13. <clears throat> Jesus says, John 3, 13, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Right? So he's talking about himself there. He says, he came down. Nobody, uh, nobody threw him out. He did not fall. He came down. Uh, turn over to John chapter number 6. John chapter number 6, pretty interesting. In verses 32 down to verse number 58, Jesus was giving that, uh, that discourse of the bread of life. You want to know, where was that bread of life passage? Jesus said something about bread of life. It's going to be John chapter 6. He's going through in great detail. We're not going to read the 20-something verses uh, there, but I do want to hit the highlights for you whenever he's talking about that bread of life. He's saying, he's drawing their, their likeness to it. He says, you remember whenever Moses uh, had that manna that came down from, uh, from heaven and, and, and fed all the people? Well, he's making that assimilation. He's saying, I am the bread of life. He says, I am the one that sustains. That's the gist of the, the passage, but I want you to see it. Uh, it says it over and over. Amen. Look at it in verse number 33. It says, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven that giveth life unto the world. The second time he says it, verse number 38, he says, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. He didn't fall. He came down. Verse 41, the Jews are talking about it. They're rehearsing the things that Jesus was saying. He says, the Jews uh, then murmured at him and uh, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Verse 42, they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Uh, go down to verse number 48. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He's going through, your fathers did eat man in the wilderness and are dead. But watch this in verse 50. It says, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. That's the fifth time he uses it. Sixth time is in the next verse, verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. The bread which I give is my flesh which I give for the life of the world. And then lastly, verse number 58, he says, this is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, and he that eateth this bread shall live forever. Seven times in this passage he goes through and he doesn't say, not one time, not one time does he say, I fell. Not once. He said, the Son of Man came down. That was a deliberate act that he, he gave. He came down. Now, who could it possibly be that fell? Well, go back with Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14. This will be somewhat familiar. We just looked at it. <clears throat> Isaiah 14. <clears throat> and we get to... Satan's part here. 
Isaiah 14 and look at verse number 12. He says, how art thou, what? Fallen from heaven. Was it Jesus? No. Oh, Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Jesus never fell. Jesus came down. Satan fell. And they says, oh, man, look at the fall of it. So God has, God has the keys. He certainly does. But notice what it says back in our text, chapter 9, verse number 1. So the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. Now watch this. And to him was given the key. It didn't say, and he took the key out of his pocket, which he already had. Amen. He said, to him was given the key of that bottomless pit. So God has the key, but he gives it to Satan. Why? Why would he give Satan a key? Well, remember, he's got a purpose that's going to be accomplished. And that purpose that is accomplished is judgment. So he's given Satan a key to be able to open up this bottomless pit. He's, he's given Satan the okay to have a little jailbreak. Amen? That's what it is that he's doing. And whenever it's over, he's going to get his key back. Don't worry, it's still his key. Amen? Uh, Satan can't say, ah ha, it's mine now. No, no, he can't do it. He'll, he, he can give the key, he'll take the key back. Amen? He is God. So that place that is, uh, that is opened is the bottomless pit. So he says, and to him, verse 1, to him was given the keys of the bottomless pit. It's also called the abyss. Now, this is never mentioned in Scripture as a place where men and women of the earth are sent. There's no mention of a person, a, a man, a woman dying and going to the bottomless pit. That's not what it is. So Satan is one day, he's going to be uh, bound for a thousand years. And he's going to be cast into that pit dungeon, and he's going to be kept there for that time. Now hell, uh, if you remember, this is a while back, uh, so I'm going to take you to the way back. Uh, we talked about hell in, in detail, but I'll give you the highlights. I remember hell has several different chambers, uh, compartments if you want to call it that, whenever you see it in Scripture. Uh, you'll see it r related to us in different words. Uh, there's one that talks about Sheol or Hades. Same place. Uh, Sheol is the Hebrew word. Hades is the Greek word, but it's the same place. Uh, it's that picture, remember, of Abraham's bosom. We talk about that in, in Luke chapter 16. They went to Abraham's uh, bosom. Uh, there was one side that was torment. Remember, that's where the rich man went. He said, I've been tormented in this flame. Send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and, and come touch my tongue. I'm tormented. Uh, but on the other side, there's, uh, there's rest at Abraham's bosom. But they said there's a great gulf that is between them. Amen? Everybody remember? Good. So that's talking about that Sheol or Hades. Now there's another place uh, that's called Toteris. So I've never heard of that before in my life. Uh, that's where, uh, that's a place where God keeps some of the fallen angels. Amen? Not all of them, but some of them, and they're still there today. Uh, go back with me real quick to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> and I'll show you the one place where this is called out. 2 Peter chapter 2. And go down to verse number 4. 2 Peter 2 <clears throat> and verse number 4. You there say amen? amen? So he says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. He said there's some angels that are cast down, they are bound in chains, and they'll stay in those chains until the time of judgment. That hell right there, that word hell, is translated from the word Tartarus. Right? Now look over real quick to Jude, right before you get to Revelation, is Jude. You'll see this, verse number 6, Jude 6 says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. All right? So that's the place of Tartarus, different place. We, we look at it and we say, well, it's hell. That's no, a different compartment of hell. Uh, God's got different places of hell. Uh, there is the lake of fire. Amen. We're familiar with that. Whenever you get to the end of Revelation, that's going to be that glorious day where it says death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Uh, that's where Satan's permanent abode is going to be when all of this is over. Whenever we get toward the end of the book of Revelation, we're going to see him and he's, he is getting his. Amen. And it's going to be a current, uh, a place that is uh, um, uh, constantly 
uh, torturing him. So death and hell. By the way, any person that you know who does not know Jesus Christ as Savior, that lake of fire is going to be, be their eternal destination. Eternal, get a hold of that. There's never a point where you're just annihilated. There's never a point where you get used to it. It's never a point where it's even like Texas where you're just like, well, you know, I've gotten you. Never. You will never, ever get used to it. That's what happens when somebody does not know Jesus Christ as Savior. It is extremely severe. We need to get a hold of that. And then, uh, but we also, we, we see this in our passage, the bottomless pit, the abyss as mentioned. So uh, we're going to see this place in Scripture. Go back with me to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter number 8. <clears throat> Luke chapter number 8, <clears throat> and let's go down to verse number 26. Now what we're going to see is we've got uh, Jesus is about to encounter a man who is possessed by demons, and Jesus approaches the man, and then they're going to respond to him. All right, so Luke chapter 8, verse number 26, says, They arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth the land, there met with him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time and wear no clothes and neither abode in any house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. Verse 29 he says, For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of him. For oft times it had caught him and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters and he brake the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. All right, so here's this man. He's got a whole legion of devils that are in him. Now watch what is, is said here in verse number 31. And they besought him, besought Jesus, that he would not command them to go out into the what? Into the deep. All right. Now it goes through. It says, and uh, there was a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain, and they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them, and he suffered them. And uh, uh, then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently, violently down a steep place into a lake, and there were choked. Now, uh, here's the deal. Sometimes we think about that, and they said, are, are you here to torture us before the time? Uh, are you going to send us into the deep? They weren't talking about the sea. It's not talking about the water that was there. Why? Because it said Jesus suffered them. He just said, he says, all right, get out. He says, can we go on the swine instead? Okay, go to the swine. They went into the swine. The swine went crazy. They ran down into the water. Jesus wasn't there going, <laughs> joke's on you. Got you anyway. He's not, that's not what he's talking about. That word deep right there is the same words that's translated that bottomless pit in chapter 9 and verse number 1. It's talking about that abyss. Whenever they're asking, they said, are you going to torture us before our time? Are you going to send us into the a pit, the abyss? Are you going to send us into that bottomless pit? Is that where it is that you're going to, to go or to, to send us to? That's what it is that they're talking to. It wasn't about the water. It's talking about that bottomless pit. Now, how could there possibly be a bottomless pit in the center of the earth? How can it go? It's where the bottomless pit, how can you have a bottomless pit in the earth? Well, if you go all the way down, you got your earth. Here's your I got nothing around. <clears throat> so uh, you come down, vision your basketball. Amen. Whoosh, comes down. It comes down to the, to the center of the earth, probably bigger than what's in my hands. Amen. A little bit bigger than that. Uh, but, but imagine, here it is. Boy, it's spinning. You got a basketball spinning on your finger. I couldn't do that, but if I could, that'd be a pretty good illustration. Uh, where's the bottom? There is no bottom. It's all sides. Just like whenever... Isaiah talked about Satan, how he was brought down to the sides of the pit. Amen? He didn't say brought down to the bottom of the pit. He said he brought down to the sides. He's bringing it all down. And so this is that bottomless pit at the center of the earth. Let's look at it real quick. Uh, some of you have that puzzled look. Isaiah 14, one more time. Isaiah 14. <clears throat> and so I'll read it again, verse 12. says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Now watch verse thir 13 here. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And verse 15 says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. 
He said, that's where it is that you're going. You're going to the place of sides, but no bottom. All right? So back in our text, Revelation 9, look at it, verse number 1. So it says, and the fifth angel sounded. So here's the woe. And I saw a star fall. That was who? Satan. I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was what? Given the key of the bottomless pit. All right, so we got this key that's about to open up the abyss from the very center of the earth that was given to Satan to do so. So Satan falls, he's given the key, but it was not people that were in that abyss, remember? It's not people. So what is it that's about to be released from that bottomless pit? Let's look at the locust. <clears throat> that's point number two if you're taking it. Verse number two, it says, And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. What does that mean? It means something's burning. Amen? Can't have smoke unless you got the fire. There is a fire that is going on there. The smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. So when he opens that pit, the very first thing that, it, that we see, it's smoke. That smoke of a great furnace, so much so that the air is, is darkened out. The sun is just blacked out by that smoke and the things that are going on. And then out of that smoke came locusts. Now to remember, uh, remember to a degree, whenever you start looking at the things in tribulation, a lot of it is a picture of what we saw with Moses and Pharaoh with the plagues that were going on at that time, to a degree. Uh, it's not the exact same thing. Uh, whenever uh, Moses, whenever there was, uh, the, the locusts came out, uh, when, and during Moses' times, those were actual locusts that ate up all the crops. Uh, these locusts have no uh, care about the crops whatsoever. That's not what it is that they were doing. So these are not the same kind of locusts. Uh, natural locusts are repelled by smoke. Amen? These actually come out of the smoke. Proverbs 30, verse number 27, it says, The locusts have no king, yet go, the, go forth all of them by bands. He said, he said man, they, they got no king. These locusts have a ruler. If you go down to verse number 11 of chapter 9, verse 11, it says, And they had a king over them. Isn't that something? Isn't that funny how Proverbs says, nah, They don't have a king. But here they says, Oh, they got a king. Amen? Different kind of locust. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. What is that? Both times it means destroyer. That was their king, the destroyer. <clears throat> so uh, they've got a ruler, uh, natural locust or plant eaters. Amen? Uh, but these don't eat plants. In verse Number three, look at it, it says, There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and upon them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So here it is, uh, those that, that they are going to attack, they're not plants, they're not eating up all the crops. Which is pretty interesting, by the way. That means the grass has had a little bit of time to come back since that last trumpet judgment. Amen. Otherwise, they'd be like, well, why give them the command? There's no grass there. Amen. So it's a little bit of time past that. But whenever they come out, they're not there for the grass. Those that, that they're going to attack are people. And not just all people. Those that are not sealed by God. That means that 144,000 and any of their converts are going to be saved. That also means that this is going to happen right about that three and a half year mark. Amen. So whenever you start looking at the trumpet judgments and looking at the time frame that's there, those first four are happening in pretty rapid succession. Those are the things that are going against nature. Now remember, whenever they were sealing the 144,000 in Revelation chapter number 7, they had those four angels holding back the four winds and saying, let no, uh, let no damage come to the natural earth there until that sealing was taking place. Amen? Well, now you've got uh, the trumpets come out, and there's all the damage that's happening to the, the natural earth. But then after that, then it's going to be those that are coming to the people. All of this has happened. Boom, 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 boom. This isn't like a, well, you know, six months later, and here's another year, and then two. No, no, it's all happening right at the same time. Uh, there's nothing that, that says that, that the angels, those first four angels, couldn't stand there with the trumpets and go, bum, 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 bum. Amen? Just that quick. 
everything's just pouring out at that time. So here it is, they're, uh, they're done with that, and, and they're coming after the people. So these demonic locusts, they're attacking the unbelievers, those that do not have the mark of God in their forehead, which is pretty ironic. Uh, they're going after the ones who actually have the mark of the beast. Now get a hold of that, because that goes kind of completely against our logic. Amen? These demon locusts get, get divine approval to inflict pain on those that worship the beast, the same one who was demanding their allegiance to begin with. Amen? Remember, this is right here at the halfway mark. This is right here whenever it's uh, uh, the uh, peace time's over, the abomination of desolation, people running for their lives, there's the mark of the beast that's going on, all this is happening. Now all of a sudden the locusts start coming, and the people who said, okay, yeah, I'll take the mark of the beast. I'll do that because I want to be able to buy and sell. I want to be able to get my goods and all that kind of thing. That's who the locusts are going for. They're the ones that's being punished. You would think that if there was this great punishment, it would be after God's people. But God said, you're not messing with my people. They're going after those that receive that mark of the beast. So these locusts inflict this, this sting like a scorpion. So uh, let's look at it, verse 4 and 5. It says, And it was commanded them that they, shouldn't, that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, <clears throat> but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Now, these locusts, it's a sting that's there, but it lasts five months. It's not just a little, oh, it's not an ouchie. Amen. It, is, it says torment three different times. They are tormented. Tormented five months, and the torment of it was the torment of a scorpion. Look at it, verse number six. It says, And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. To me, that's that's one of the one of the things that stands out in the whole book of Revelation more than probably anything else to me. There is such a matter of torment that's going on that people would actually want to die and they can't. There's so much pain, they're seeking to end their own life. The Bible says there in verse number 6 that they will seek death, and then it goes on and says, and they shall desire to die. Now what does that mean? To seek, uh, if you're seeking death, that means you're plotting it out. Amen? You're putting the plan together. That is your great desire. And, and, and whenever it talks about it, they desire that death, they are setting their heart upon it. Now think about it, to be in such torment where they look and say, the only relief I could possibly get is to be able to end it all. And yet it wouldn't happen. Not only it wouldn't happen, it could not happen. It says death would flee from them. Think about it, man would try to eliminate their own suffering, and in so doing they would only add to their own torment. <clears throat> Remember 9-11? Whenever the planes hit the buildings? Remember the footage that was there, the, the flames were coming up, the, the buildings, the people didn't have any kind of hope. The flames were getting hotter, and instead of being consumed in the flame, they jumped. They knew, they were, they knew the end of it. But there was not, they said, at least it'll be over. Can you imagine jumping, landing, and you're not dead? It just amplifies the punishment that's there. God says, you're not going to die. You're going to continue to endure the things that's going on. God's showing them that He has the power to torment them for as long as He chooses. They're getting, what, what is that? They're getting a foreshadowing of hell. And if you get that picture in your mind, you're also getting a foreshadowing of hell. To be able to know that the torment is so great that you just want it to be over, and it can't. They have the desire to have the torment to end, and it won't. They want to die. They can't die. I don't know of anything. Think, I want you to get this. If you do not know Christ as Savior, that's the end. The desire to just have it all over. And for all of eternity, you cannot. For all of eternity, torment. Then he goes on, he starts describing the locusts. He gives a picture of what it is. You ever think about that? Why would he do that? Why would John describe the locusts? 
I mean, honestly, I think you'd recognize them. Amen. The first little pal. Oh, that's it. I mean, it's not like your regular bug flying around. But he's going through and he's given the description. And I think it's very telling because whenever he's given this, it's not just for the visual. We think about that and we, you know, artists try to put it all together, you know, and they're trying to make these little collages of different kind of, you know, whatever. And, and make it, it's not about the picture. It's about the character. And that's what it is that he's showing in the midst of all of this. Now look at what he says, verse number 7. He says, the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. They had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. Now, remember, he's, he's using those likes and as in there. He's putting those similes in. He's saying, the best I can describe, this, this, is, this is what it is that he's trying to portray. He's not just trying to say, oh, there's these little miniature horses that are just kind of buzzing through, you know, and they got, no, no, he's, he's, he's trying to give a picture of everything that he can to describe it all. So he says, uh, it's like, in verse number seven, it's like horses prepared unto battle. What does that mean? Prepared unto battle. They were disciplined. They were determined. You start looking at these locusts. They, uh, they were ready to wage that battle of torment against those that had been deceived by the devil. They were on purpose. Amen. Those horses for battle, what do they mean? If you've got a horse ready for battle, uh, if there's armament that you're going to put on your horse to protect your horse, you're going you're to have that on. They're going to have their, the, the, business, uh, the business face on. And most importantly, there's going to be a rider. Nobody ever turns loose the horses with a javelin on it and say, do your best, whack, and they, yeah. No, no, they, they're always under the control of a leader. And whenever he's talking about these, these horses prepared unto battle, that's the preparation. None of these are, uh, none of these are casual in their, uh, in their desires. Uh, none of them have their own agenda. No, they are under the control, under the hand of another. He goes on, he says, on their head were, as it were, crowns like gold. That gold-colored appendages on their head indicates that, that temporary control over those that are afflicted. They have the crowns that are there. What is that crown? That crown is a sign of authority. Amen. It's not decoration. It's authority that's there. That's what it is whenever you have a king. You got the king with the crown, he puts the crown on, so everybody says, there's the king. It's to show that, that he is the authority, and they have the authority to be able to inflict this damage. It goes on and says, uh, their faces, verse number 7, and their faces were as the faces of men. That's interesting. They were not like locust faces. They didn't say, well, you know, it's a little bug face. It was not, they had, what was it? not only did they have the face, just like a demon would, but they also had the personality. They had the intelligence. It was a demonic horde. These are not just GMO insects that kind of corrupted over. No, no. This is, this is straight satanic. This is the attack that's happening. Verse number 8, now notice this. It says, and they had hair as the hair of women. Now, why would he talk about that? It's interesting. John lists out these two, two genders. Amen. He talks about the faces of men, but they got hair like women. The hair of the women is not talking about the texture. It's not talking about, oh, it's long and flowing. It was, you know, a pantene. It was not. It's talking about the length. There's a length that's there. Now, Paul talked about this as well. Turn back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> it's interesting. He starts talking about hair. So you didn't know you were going to get this tonight. But 1 Corinthians 11, <clears throat> and go down to verse number 14. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 14. He says, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Now, the point is here, the, the, the hair was a distinguishing factor. It was a distinguishing characteristic. If you read the passage, whenever it's looking at that, it's not a matter of saying, all right, your hair and your hair and all that. It was talking about submission. That's what the passage is talking about. Biblical submission is the context. There was supposed to be submission to the Lord. There was supposed to be submission within the home. And that's what it was that Paul was addressing. Long hair on a man signified shame. 
That's what he said in verse number 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. He says it's a shame. Where is that shame coming from? Well, what he's looking at here, remember, he's talking about submission in the home. Whenever the long hair was there, what is that? He's talking about there was rebellion against what it is that God has established. It's a matter of rebellion. By the way, men should look like men. Amen. Amen. Uh, that's not legalism. It's called honoring what it is that God established. You know, <clears throat> it's pretty amazing. Whenever, uh, whenever a man wants to rebel against God, whenever a man wants to live in rebellion against God, you know what the thing that, that often is the first thing to change? It's the hair. Got to grow out my hair. Amen. Everybody goes through that stage. Why is it they were going through this stage of growing out the hair? Because there's that, that desire to be able to go along with the things of the world rather than God. Whenever you get right down to the spiritual nature of what's going on, there is a matter, there is a battle that is going on that is a matter of rebellion against God. And remember, the world is at enmity with God. Whenever you start following after the world, what is that? You're rebelling against God. God has things in order. God is saying there's supposed to be a submission, there's supposed to be a reverence, not a rebellion against Him. Amen? <clears throat> so these demonic locusts, what are they? Why is it they've got the face of a man but the hair of a woman? It's a picture of rebellion. That's the great motivation that was there. Verse number 8, it says, uh, They had the hair, the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. That large teeth of the lions for ripping, tearing flesh. That's what it's for. Verse number 9, he goes on, says, uh, they, had the, uh, they had breastplates, as it were, the breastplates of iron. Iron in Scripture, pretty interesting. <clears throat> a couple of different pictures, but one of the big ones that we see, especially right here, it's a picture of the Roman Empire. We see it back in Daniel's vision with the ten uh, toes where the, the, where the Antichrist was coming from that kingdom. Uh, if you go back with me real quick to the book of Daniel, chapter number 2. Daniel, chapter number 2. Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Chapter 2 and verse number 40. So Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 40 is talking about these four uh, beasts. There's four uh, Gentile empires that are taking place. And he goes through and he's describing Babylon and, and Persia and, and the Grecian Empire and then the Roman Empire. <clears throat> and that's what you see in chapter 2 verse number 40. It says, And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as what? iron. For as much as, watch this, iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. He's talking about this. Uh, Rome had great strength. Great strength in their military, in their power, in their rule, in their suppression. They were noted for it. It was called, uh, it, this is where we get that phrase, they, they ruled with an iron thumb. There's, it was an iron rule. <clears throat> Rome had this reputation of, of crushing all opposition and all resistance. That's what you see with the picture of iron. There's a power that's there, great power, uh, and it's, it's used a lot. You want to do a good word study and study more? Go, go study out iron this week. Amen? Are you going to see Sisera? Uh, Sisera led the attack against the Israelites with 900 chariots of iron iron. Remember Goliath? Goliath had the spearhead where he was challenging uh, the, uh, the Israelites. Guess what? That spearhead had the 600 shekels of iron. He didn't call it out and just say, well, you know, it was a heavy spear. No, no, it was 600 shekels of iron. Uh, it was just, it was there to break apart everything that it hit. Back in our text, chapter 9, verse number 9, it goes on, says there, the breastplate says, were the breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. What does it mean? It wasn't just a couple here and there. It wasn't just a couple of these locusts that were, that were going about. Those wings and had the volume of the masses that were coming. Can I tell you, there was no escape. You couldn't just hole up in the apartment and just say, well, I just won't go out. Oh, it's okay. They'll come in. There's no, there's no getting around it. There's no way that you could put on something that would, you know, well, I'm going to wear my leather jacket. That's gonna, it's not going to help. No, uh, it is a judgment that was coming. Verse number 10 says, and they had tails. Remember, they started describing, they looked at the overview. He's describing it from the head all the way to the back and all the things that were coming against him. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were, the, and there were stings in their tails, 
and their power was to hurt men five months. We talked about that pain already. But think about it. The pain, he uses a scorpion. It wasn't a honeybee. Honeybee stings you once, amen? And then they go off and die somewhere. That's the only repercussion. It's like, that's right, you're getting yours, buddy. Scorpion just keeps on stinging. They don't just, they don't just come out and pop one time. Over and over. The torment on top of torment. Can you imagine? You get stung three, four times in the last five months, and then it's amplified for however many times you get hit. Those that reject Jesus are going to have to contend with this whole demonic horde. Now think about it. They're swift as horses, victorious as conquerors. They're intelligent, rebellious, ravenous like wild lions, well protected as an army, got the iron breastplates on them, protected in the heart. You, you're not going to kill them. And inspiring fear, even for the desire of death, bringing people to the point where they say, I just want to die, and yet they can't, and it goes on for five solid months. Notice what he says, chapter 9, verse 12, will be done. One woe is past, and behold, there come two more woes hereafter. All this is going on, he said, that's just the start. That's just the start. I'm glad I won't be there to experience it firsthand. And if you're not sure, if you can't look and say, I'm absolutely positive, I will not be there either. Man, today's the day to get that settled. Right. Amen. Oh, don't. Listen, God gives us the picture so we know what lies ahead. We'll never be able to stand before God and say, I would have never known. If I would have just known the torment that was there, I would have received the gift. God's going to say, look, I made salvation easy. You didn't have to work for it. You didn't have to do enough good. You had to recognize that you're a sinner. Jesus was the Savior and receive it just like you received a gift at Christmas. For your birthday, here's your gift. Open it up. He says, that's what I did for you. I took all the punishment. I'm giving you myself and all you have to do is receive Him. That's it. Don't make salvation harder than what it is. God already did all the hard part. He, man, He took all of that just so that you could have it to be received. Don't miss what God does. You got a lost neighbor? Get a burden in your heart for them. Get a picture of what it is that they're going to go through. You got a lost loved one? Get on your face and start praying for them. Don't, don't let up. Amen? Do all that you can to reach them with the gospel. Well, they don't want to listen. They might not. But you don't want it you don't ever want to be able to say, I don't think I did all that I could. I think I could have done more. Do all that you can. The more that you go through Revelation, I want you to understand the very grace and mercy of our God. He says, I'm giving you the, you've got the, you got it made, man. You have got the Word of God right here. You get to see all the truth of it. You get to hear it and understand it. You get to hear it. I mean, there's people that are dying on the other side of the world that have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel, and we get to do it over and over and over. And God says, I'm doing that so that you will know me. There's no reason for any person here to be lost. We have the opportunity. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll have a hymn of invitation. Our Heavenly Father. Lord, we want to thank you for the things that you show us in Scripture. God, I can't imagine anybody having to go through the torments that are awaiting that time of tribulation. <clears throat> and especially, Lord, to be able to know the gospel itself and, Lord, to reject it. I can't imagine. But, Lord, I also know how much battle that goes on in the hearts of people. So I pray, Lord, right now, if there's one here that's struggling with that decision, that you give them a perfect peace about receiving Christ as Savior. Dear God, you can do that work. The Holy Spirit does that work, and we thank you for it. And I pray, Lord, that every person here would be saved. Lord, as we start studying through your word and we see this, I just rejoice in what it is that you've done for us in giving us the opportunity to know you, to live for you and to serve you. I pray, Lord, that we're yielded to you, all the things that you have, all the things that you want. Lord, I pray, God, that we are ready to honor you with our lives. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.
Page number 280. 280. You need to come pray. Why don't you come pray? You got somebody on your heart? Somebody needs to be saved? Why don't you come pray for them? Lift them up in prayer. You need to be saved? Come on. Now's the time. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. We tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me. Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? Come home. out in the word of prayer. If you're able to help getting some stuff down from the closets up there, so we appreciate that. And uh, so we'll take um, the puppet stage and back in the that, that <coughs> over there, back in the behind that door. Flower room. Thank you, brother. So uh, anybody, if you can help with that, sure appreciate it. Let's close out in the word of prayer. Our Father, we want to thank you for the day. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to be able to hear a portion of your word and be challenged by it. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would give us victories over death and hell and sin that only comes through Christ. Lord, help us to be able to lift up the name of Jesus everywhere that we go. To those that need it the most, Lord, I pray, Father, to those that are without Christ, I ask you, Lord, to give them a burden of their heart. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would accomplish what only you can do. Lord, as we go out into the, the uh, neighborhoods this Thursday, I pray, Lord, that you would open up doors of opportunity, open up hearts to be able to receive your word. We thank you for those that have already been spoken to. We pray, God, that you would accomplish much in them, that, uh, Lord, those that have been able to receive the gospel this past week, I pray, Lord, that it would uh, truly find a great, a fertile heart to be able to take root in. 
Lord, we look forward to our Vacation Bible School as well. We pray, Lord, that you would begin to prepare all those children that are going to be able to hear of you. And, Lord, that they would uh, be saved early and, and be encouraged in your word. Lord, just do that mighty work. We want to thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen.